again. So welcome to the, to the last lecture of this tutorial. This is where we finally get down to the recent advances in topological machine learning. So we will be looking at a different machine learning methods that are driven by topology-based features. And again, if you have feedback or questions, write me an email, shoot me a DM on Twitter. You can find the slides and additional information on the website. All right, that being said, what did we see? The recap is we saw that persistence diagrams are somehow the basic or natural topological feature descriptor. They have some disadvantages, but also some neat properties. However, there are multiple alternatives depending on the applications that you want to solve. And all of those have different key properties. And in, these, in, in essence, everything boiled down to saying that it's your data and so it should be your choice of, of descriptor. But this was, all, this was all maybe a little bit overwhelming. So now let's take a look at what people have actually done in this field. So now we're, this is kind of the, I would say the keystone lecture in which we put everything together. How can we actually build topology-based machine learning methods? And moreover, how do those models perform in practice? So first of all, the simple feature-based analysis pipeline. And this is pretty great because it's suitable for point clouds, for graphs, for whatever. So this works whenever you can pick an appropriate filtration. It might be a filtration based on the vertex degree. It might be a filtration based on distances. Then you just calculate the, your persistence diagrams. You vectorize them using the persistence images shown on the right-hand side and you use an arbitrary feature-based algorithm, such as an SVM or random forest or whatever, and use them as features in your algorithm. And you can do this, you can do this to classify your objects. So a brief example of this, which is also very interesting because, it's, because it uses a cubicle setting. So it goes beyond the simplicial setting and it uses an fMRI volume as an input. Here, our filtration is induced by the activation function, by the bold function of the fMRI data. We use persistence images to obtain a time varying embedding because every subject of this fMRI study had a time series of fMRI measurements attached to it. Those time series had the same length, so our work was cut out for us in that sense. And then we were able to describe the topological di dynamics based on a dimensionality reduction algorithm. So essentially this boiled down to calculating the persistence images and calculating a dimensionality reduced representation of each image. And this made it possible for us to learn about differences of subgroups in the population we were looking at. So I'm not going into too many details here, but it was pretty cool to see that the age stratified subgroups that we were looking at. So all those people were being subjected to the same movie. So they watched the same movie while being uh, recorded in an fMRI machine. And we could see that as the, as the age of the, um, of the subgroups increased, their, topo their topology based representations became more complex. So if you disregard a little bit of the noise here, which we can also get around um, and, and, and remove in some other representations, you can see that younger children, so this is one of the cohorts was, uh, were children of ages 3.5 to 5.5 years, for example. As the age increased, the topology-based representation of their activation function also increased in complexity. And of course, this this is not this should not convince you that uh, it's that, that that this is a very useful descriptor. But we we correlated this to to some other measures, and we were able to predict the age group, for example, of children directly from their topology-based summaries. And we were also able to show that if we restrict the analysis of the topology to certain parts of the brain, then we can easily disentangle different parts of their of their visual system, of their complexity, of their visual processing. And we could show that younger children, for example, are unable to, to use information about 
let's say, memory or about more complex tasks while watching such a movie. And they just are very, they are primarily visually focused, I would say. So that's one of the findings of this, of this paper that the, the, uh, the older you get, the more you're able to make sense of complex relationships in the same movie. And whereas the younger you are, the more all the processing of your movie is driven by essentially the visual stuff that goes, that goes into, your, into your brain. But I just, just at a, as, a very si as a very simple example or a side note of doing this for time varying cubicle complex, which is to my understanding also one of the first applications of this, of this sort. Another thing that works really well is the classification of unlabeled graphs using classical machine learning models again. So here you would take the, again, the degree filtration. So you would, you would look at the, um, at the edges and, and vertices of a, of a graph. You would sort them accordingly. You would repeat the analysis pipeline that I described previously. And then you could learn weights for the topological descriptors to improve the predictive power. Um, this is the paper by Zhao and Wang that I previously mentioned in the last lecture. And this makes it really easy to classify unlabeled graphs because since you don't have a label anyway for any of the nodes in, in the graphs or for the edges, the degree turns out to be a relatively good descriptor of the information that is contained in that graph. So now let's move on to something more complicated. And this is a small digression, but it's, I hope it's well worth it. So we're looking at the WL iteration or the weisfeller lehmann iteration and its subtree feature vector. This was developed in the, I would say, 50s or 60s now by Weisfeller and Lehmann. And the idea was to create a test for graph isomorphism. So a test to figure out whether two graphs are isomorphic to each other. To spoil you, it turns out that this test does not actually work that well. Well, by which I mean that it's not, it doesn't solve the graph isomorphism problem because if it did, that would be, that would be awesome because the, the iteration is really simple to calculate and it would, it's essentially being able, you can essentially do it in, in polynomial time. However, it turns out that the resulting features or the resulting iteration scheme is still useful to describe the dissimilarity between two graphs. So how does it work? This might sound eerily familiar because it's essentially what all the graph neural networks are doing. And there's a recent paper, well, not so recent anymore in machine learning terms by Yegel Ka, uh, on the graph isomorphism network, which does make this link between the WL iteration and graph neural networks very explicit. So anyway, the, the, the process is very simple. You go to a node, you look at your own label. Here the labels are created using colors because otherwise we would have to have uh, node labels and the labels of those nodes again. So this would make it more complicated. So here's just colors. You look at your own label and you look at the labels of your neighbors. So for example, you have, uh, you're here at node A. Node A has one neighbor, namely C, and node A is blue and its neighbor is also blue. So you mark your own label as blue and the adjacent labels as blue. And this also works for the others. There is no sorting whatsoever. It's just, it just looks a little bit neater when I draw it like this, but this is just a set or a multi-set if you want. And now what you do is you hash this label or you hash the information between the two labels. So you take your own label and the adjacent labels, you make it into a multi-set and you hash it and you give it a different color. And this hashing needs to be perfect. So the same neighborhoods need to be mapped to the same labels. So essentially anything that has a blue label and also one blue label in its neighborhood is now mapped to this green color here. So you can see that this works. A, B, and G are all mapped to the same color. Whereas D and F, which have a different label here for their own node label, are mapped to a different color here. And I hope that no one of you is too color blind because it's really hard to, to illustrate this with a color palette that can be distinguished by, by all people equally. But let's, let's hope that it works. So anyway, this is the way you describe your, your hashed labels. And once you have this hashed label representation, you can create 
a histogram feature vector, which just counts how often each of the colors appears in a graph. So in this case, you would say, oh, okay, this green label here occurs three times, the orange one one times, the violet one two times, and the pink one once. And this gives you a feature vector, three, one, two, one of your graph. And now you can compare two graphs, G and G prime, by evaluating some form of kernel or distance or whatever you prefer between those two feature vector representations. Moreover, you can, of course, repeat this iteration step using the hashed labels. So as long as you have a perfect hashing scheme that is capable of producing and telling apart the different colors, you can repeat this process. And by repeating it multiple times, you will incorporate more information about the neighborhood of the graph. This is the Weisfeller-Lehmann iteration or subtree feature vector in a nutshell, because you take this, pardon me, you take this, you take this graph and you, you repeat this process, you get a feature vector of a certain depth, depending on how many iterations you have, and you get this, um, and you can compare the graphs using this representation. Now let's move to, to a recent paper of mine. This is together with Christian and Carsten. It's called a persistent Weisfeller-Lehmann procedure for graph classification. And the idea behind this is, is really simple, namely, the Weisfeller-Lehmann algorithm can vectorize labeled graphs and persistent homology captures its relevant topological features. So we can combine the two of them to obtain a generalized formulation of this description. And this requires a distance between the multisets that we generate in this, in this representation. So how can we generate a distance between label multisets? Well, suppose that we have two multisets A and B, and they are defined over the same label alphabet sigma, so L1, L2, and so on and so forth. Then we can transform these sets into count vectors. So we would, trans we would just look at how often does the label L1 occur in the set A, how often does the label L1 occur in the set B, and this gives us two count vectors, A1, A2, and so on and so forth, B1, B2, and so on and so forth. And this gives us a way to calculate a multi-set distance between those two vectors as the as some Minkowski distance between the labels. So instead of looking at a very complex uh, label distance, we just look at a count distance. And now, since the, the nodes and the multi-sets are in one-to-one -one correspondence, so we always know which multi-set belongs to which node, we now have a metric on the graph. Of course, that's, you actually have to show this and it's going to be a little bit more complicated, but we're not interested in this. It, it becomes a metric. So how does this, how does it look in practice? So moving back to the original example, we would, we would say that the distance between the nodes C and E is the distance between their respective label multisets. So we take a look at what does this node C here. So C has neighbors E, B, A, and D. And we observe three blue nodes and one red node. And likewise, E has neighbors G, C, and F. And so we observe two blue nodes and one red node. And the distance according to our scheme, if we set the Minkowski exponent to one, is the distance between three, one, and two, one. And this is just one. And likewise, we can do the same thing for C and A, and we can see that C and E are much closer in that distance than C and A. And this kind of makes sense because the neighborhoods of those two nodes are more similar to each other than the neighborhoods of the nodes A and the node C, right? So this just gives us a multi-set distance between the, between the individual label multisets that we observe. But we want to extend this multi-set distance now to distance between vertices of the graph. And for this, we have to incorporate the label from the previous iteration of this rehashing of this, of this coloring algorithm. So we take the previous label of the Weisfeller-Lehmann iteration that we call LVI indexed by H minus one, so the previous iteration, as well as the label LVIH from the current iteration. 
and we evaluate this neat distance here. So this is an Iverson bracket that counts whether those labels are different from each other. So it's either zero or one, plus the distance here between the two labels multisets as shown on the previous slide, plus tau, which is a small constant that is required to make this into a proper metric. For more details, see the paper. But the intuition behind this is that this turns any labeled graph into a weighted graph. And we can calculate the persistent homology of weighted graphs because the weights just yield a neat way to filtrate the graph. So suddenly we have built a bridge between the labeled world and the unlabeled world or the weighted world. So first of all, how does, how does this look? What, what, what properties does this vertex distance have? So depending on how many iterations of this relabeling scheme we make, this defines how different our, our metric is, how sensitive it is with respect to the distances in neighborhoods. So this is, a, this is a, an adjacency matrix of the graph with weights according to the multi-set distance that I showed previously. And you can see that if you don't have any, any relabeling operation at all, so h equals zero, you don't go into the graph as such, you're, you have a very coarse metric. So it's either zero or one, depending on whether your neighboring node has, a, has, a, has the same label or not. But if you, if you increase this a little bit, you see that you get much more information out of this, out of this metric. And this makes it possible to, to get a very nuanced view of your graph for classification. And in fact, this makes it also possible to create what we call the persistence-based Weisfeller-Lehmann feature vectors. And in contrast to the original Weisfeller-Lehmann relabeling scheme, we can also get cycle information. I'm not going into too many details here, but we can calculate the persistence of every feature and aggregate this over the label that we observe for that feature. And we can do the same thing with our cycles. And here, what one of the attendees remarked is, is remarkably easy to do here. Namely, we are only looking at connected components and cycles. So our algorithm can be implemented really efficiently and it's, it's tantamount to going over the graph once. So it's a, it's a simple, it's linear in the number of edges and the number of nodes in the graph. We only have to look at every part of the graph at most once, and this gives us all the information that we need to calculate those feature vectors. And everything is weighted using the persistence of the corresponding features. So this generalizes the Weisfeller-Lehmann scheme in the following sense. We can redefine this vertex distance that I showed you to obtain the original Weisfeller-Lehmann subtree features. And this we can simply achieve by defining a distance that is one if the vertex labels don't agree and it's zero otherwise. So this whole spiel was a way to show how to generalize an existing algorithm and show that it's actually a specific substance instance of a persistence-based algorithm. And as you can see here, it really works when compared to, to, other, to other more complex approaches. It performs relatively well. It performs very favorably. In particular, since we did not even try to make a very complex hyperparameter tuning for our own algorithm. So the hyperparameter grid of the competitor methods was much more complex than the hyperparameter grid of our own. So I'm reasonably sure that we could even gain some more percentage points. But I want to particularly highlight this following number here because I find it interesting. By integrating cycles, so this is PWLC, means persistent Weisfeller-Lehmann with cycles, we gain, we gain almost, well, yeah, more than four percentage points for this classification scenario by integrating the cycles. So the addition of more topological features shows you how to make classification much more efficient and much more effective in practice and much more expressive. And you're free to try this out. It's, it's on the net. There's a, there's a GitHub implementation. And I, and I really 
really would urge you to, to take a look at this if you're interested in topology-based graph classification because it's a very, very neat example of demonstrating what can be done here. And all of this is based on a single weight-based filtration. So this could be adding more filtrations or adding more complex filtrations could even change the results somewhat further. Right, so now moving on, what else can we do? The thing you've been waiting for, because this was also kind of a shallow approach still, because we did, we used an SVM to obtain all of those things. But now let's take a look at, at the, well, the godfather of, of topology-based machine learning, if you will. And this is the paper, Deep Learning with Topological Signatures by Hofer and colleagues. The, I would say that this is arguably the first successful combination of deep learning and topology, and it's in Europe's paper from 2017. The rough outline, we will take a look at the details in a second. The rough outline is that you take a graph filtration to obtain persistence diagrams. This graph filtration is also based on the degree again. Then you define a layer to project persistence diagrams to a 1D function. You learn the parameters for multiple projections. You stack those projected diagrams and you use them as features. And this gives you a way to, to learn an automated projection of your to topological information in end-to-end -end fashion. The only thing you can't skip, but we will see this in a second, how this is possible. The only thing you cannot go back to the, to the persistence diagram calculation. So this is, this is how we will end essentially. This is the, the last project that I will show in this lecture, uh, how, to, how to go back and how to change the persistence representation based on a classification or on a, on a embedding objective. But in this case, for this, for this paper here, you learn how to project persistence diagrams in an efficient manner and in an effective manner so that a classification objective can be reached. And the, the details are, are, really, are really simple, even though they might not look that way at first. So the main ingredient is a differentiable coordinatization scheme of the form psi going from diagram to the real numbers. So writing CD for a tuple and diagram, again, in what I call creation persistence coordinates. So these are the coordinates that you obtain by flipping the diagram or by rotating it by 45 degrees. Then we just calculate these sort of exponential expressions here. So I'm not going into all the details here, but you have an additional parameter uh, mu one, mu zero, which is a mean representation. You have a sigma parameter, sigma zero and sigma one, which is a smoothing parameter. And you have a, 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 a new parameter which is a kind of thresholding parameter. And supposing that your, that your parameter is in the right range for this, for this new parameter, for example, you go, uh, you calculate this exponentially weighted expression here where you take your feature C, you subtract it from the, from the first mu one, uh, from mu zero, pardon me, um, and in the other component, you subtract it from mu one. And the, the interesting thing is that this is, this is kind of, the, way, the right way to think about this is that it's a trainable projection. So it projects your persistence diagram onto the, onto the, the real valued line and it uses a bunch of trainable parameters. So it learns the right mu parameter and learns the right sigma parameter and the right uh, new parameter to do that. And since this is only done for one feature here. So it's psi of P. You can represent the whole diagram as a sum over each of these projections. So essentially using N of those different coordinatization schemes, you obtain differential the embedding of a persistence diagram into some real dimensional space. And that's really all there is to it. So you stack those on top of each other and thus you make these embeddings trainable. It's, pardon me for, for this maybe weird analogy, but it's kind of similar to, to convolution-based approach, right? Where you have different feature filters or feature maps that you learn. And it's essentially the same thing, just for persistence diagrams. So to show you the, the, the rough classification pipeline, you take a graph, you filtrate it, use this magic persistent homology function, you obtain a diagram, 
you calculate this psi function with different parameters, n times, and you use the resulting features in a deep learning architecture, making it possible to do anything you want with it, in, including, of course, um, graph, graph classification. So to, to summarize this, this paper, they show an excellent performance for social network graph classification. So in particular, when you compare these numbers here, you can find that what I mentioned early on, I think in lecture two, if you include the essential features, so the features in the persistence diagram that have no finite destruction time, then suddenly your classification goes up by quite a lot. So they can considerably outperform other approaches here on these data sets by including cycle information. Because in this case, and you have to refer to the paper for details about this, but in this case, the essential features correspond to cycles in your data set. Yeah, the, another advantage of this approach is that it's really simple to implement and use. And the feature maps that you get are even interpretable because they tell you something about the, the mean and the smoothing that you have. And so you can, you can take a look at them and you can use them. Moreover, it's highly generic and it's definitely not restricted to graph classification problems. In fact, I summarized this paper very succinctly, but they also have experiments where they do shape classification, but I'm more interested for this lecture, I'm more interested in graph classification right now. And again, you can try it out. You can find more information in this, in this QR code. So Christoph, my, my colleague uh, from this paper, uh, has, has an excellent repository now where he shows how to include persistent homology and PyTorch. So if you ever wanted to, to start a project with this, this is, this is your go-to uh, GitHub repository, I would say. And I'm not being paid by them, just, just to know. All right, so moving on to another project uh, of which I'm, which I'm very happy to, um, to discuss. This is the topological autoencoders. Uh, paper that was just accepted at ICML 2020. It's with my colleagues, Michael, Max, and Karsten again. And here we're trying to solve a different problem. So previously everything was about classification, right? But now we are looking into autoencoders. We're looking into the, into a way of constraining topological information. And I was really Looking forward to this, I had tested this slide multiple times and I'm happy to see that it works. So the basic idea is that what happens if we, if we tell an autoencoder something about the underlying topological characteristics of the space? What if we can constrain an autoencoder with the topology of the latent space? So this example is, is based on on a set of high dimensional spheres, which are nested in a bigger enclosing sphere. And you can see that, again, showing the animation, if you use a regular autoencoder, all these spheres are being pushed apart. And of course you can use them, you can, you can use this latent representation to visualize uh, to some extent what is going on. You can show that, that, the, that there are some spheres in there which get kind of compressed or kind of, kind of stretched but you don't see this nesting relationship. Whereas, whereas with the topological autoencoder, you clearly see that something is going on, that this, that this big sphere here is living at a different scale and it subsumes the original low dimensional spheres in, in its latent space. So this is just the rough outline of what we wanted to solve and why, and why this makes sense and why, why we think that this is important. So to give you an overview, what we're solving is what we're proposing or solving is essentially this. Um, taking some, we take some input data, we take some autoencoder, and in the above arrow, we get the usual reconstruction metric, right? So we calculate, we calculate the, we, we, we train the autoencoder architecture, we try to get a good reconstruction, we get a reconstruction loss. So that's, that's the standard way that you usually do. But we add topological information by looking at the input data on a batch level and the latent representation also on a batch level. And we try to get a topological loss out of there. So we try to, to not only look at how well we can reconstruct the data, 
but also at how well this reconstruction represents or preserves topological information. This is the, this is the goal of this project. So how do we do this? So the main intuition that we had to solve here, and this is where we, where we make the, the full circle to, to the Wasserstein and bottleneck distances, the main intuition why this works is that we want to align persistence diagrams of an input batch and of a latent batch using a loss function. And this works in theory because we have a nice theorem that tells us that if we subsample a point cloud repeatedly, so we do batches essentially, then we can bound the probability of the persistence diagrams of the subsample exceeding a threshold in terms of the bottleneck distance. And we can bound this by the Hausdorff distance between the two point clouds. So in other words, the mini batches of the point clouds are topologically similar if the subsampling is not too coarse. Of course, if we take if we take only two points, then it will be super coarse. But in general, we can bound this based on the Hausdorff distance between the subsamples. And so this is, a, this is the theoretical underpinning of the alignment process. The other thing that we had to solve, and this is where it, where it gets really interesting. So the previous approaches, they were unable to, to map something back to the persistent homology calculation. Because if you recall from the very first lectures, everything that we do here is, has kind of a discrete ring to it, right? Because we, we calculate this matrix reduction and we, we, we add columns in some order and, and whatnot. So the, the other challenging part of this project was to figure out how to get a gradient calculation going. And for this, we were looking at the distance matrices of the space. So notice that we're not looking at the objects themselves. We're just looking at distance matrices in the space. And we noticed that every point in the persistence diagram can be mapped to one entry in the distance matrix. And since each entry is a distance, it can be changed during training, at least in the latent space, because we have full control over the latent space while training an autoencoder, right? We can change the point positions and those will change the distances. And the distance is a, a continuous and differentiable uh, function of the two points. And so hence it can be trained with a gradient. So how does it look like? If we have a distance matrix that gives rise to a certain persistence diagram here, then we can take a look at this mapping and we can say, ah, this point in the persistence diagram maps to this distance is here. Notice that this distance matrix is actually overspecified. We would only need the upper or lower diagonal of the distance matrix because of course it's a, it's a, it's a symmetric matrix. But essentially all the points in the diagram are in one-to-one -one correspondence with distances in the distance matrix, provided that the distances that occur in the latent space are distinct. This is our one caveat. So this is the condition that makes the, the mapping differentiable and generic, because if that is satisfied, the gradient is unique and exists. All right. And with that, having, with that intuition squared away, our loss term boils down to a sum of two loss terms, one that looks from at the loss from the input space to the latent space and the other one that looks at the loss that you incur from the latent space to the input space. And both of these loss terms boil down to a distance calculation between distances that have been pre-selected by the persistence calculation. So without going into too many details here, we are looking at the distance matrix matrices in the in the input mini batch, so X, AX, or the latent mini batch. And we're looking at the persistence pairing of the input mini batch or the latent mini batch. So the persistence pairing is nothing but the raw form of the persistence diagram in a sense, where instead of drawing the points directly, we just we just pair the simplices. It doesn't matter. It could have been this is just for notational convenience. We could have also just written a diagram here. And so the, 
the loss that goes from the input space to the latent space is defined by evaluating the distances that we get if we pretend that we use the persistence pairing of the input mini, mini batch for both the latent distances and the input distances. So this is not a mistake here. It's pi x both, uh, both of the times. So the persistence pairing of the input mini batch is used in both of these. Whereas for the loss that goes from the latent space to the input space, we are looking both times at the persistence pairing of the latent mini batch. And as you can see, there's always only a matrix difference involved, which makes this differentiable as long as the distances are unique, because this is certainly differentiable. This is a norm, this is a square, um, this is one half, this doesn't change differentiability at all. So in essence, we have a bidirectional loss that is differentiable and that can change the topological structure of the latent space to resemble that of the of the input space. So this is this is really this is really neat because it gives you a way to generate a latent space that closely approximates the topology of the input mini batch. So all right. So how does it look in practice? So what what can we do with it? First of all, I want to note that it's a highly generic formulation, which is which is really awesome. So we can plug this loss term into anything, into, into a PCA even if we want to. And we can always make an algorithm to some extent topology aware. And we can tune how much, how much of an influence we want to have and so on and so forth. But I really want to point towards these two guys here. So this is what you get when you use a vanilla autoencoder. And this is what you get when you use the topology-based autoencoder, so with the additional loss term. And you can see that this, this high dimensional sphere data set is really well represented here. So it shows you that there's an enclosing sphere, it shows you that there are smaller spheres and so on and so forth. Whereas other algorithms, in particular TSNE or UMAP, they all to some extent rip apart the, the structure that is inherent to the data. So they are not capable of preserving both of these topological features at the same time. And in particular, this, this Eisenmap algorithm is is really crazy here, for example, because it, it does not even tell you that there is an, an, an enclosing sphere. We're not sure what is, what is going on here, but you can clearly see that, that this additional information, this additional topological information is extremely helpful in regularizing your, your model. That's only the qualitative evaluation though. So I don't wanna bore you with too many details here, but the quantitative evaluation also shows favorable results. So the best result is always bold and underlined and the second best is just bold. And I want to, I want to particularly pay attention to, to this column here. So this is the, the mean squared error that you get from the actual reconstruction, whenever that is appropriate, of course. And you can see that including the topology-based loss term, of course, changes your reconstruction objective. So in essence, topology pulls in one direction and reconstruction pulls in another direction, right? Because both of these goals, they can be, they are somewhat orthogonal to each other. They can be somewhat orthogonal to each other. But we can see that adding the loss term does not incur too much of a penalty here. So it goes from 0 0.81 from the, a, from the autoencoder to 0 0.86 in the topology-based autoencoder. And likewise for the, for the other data sets. So you can always see that it kind of behaves as it should. It goes a little bit up when we add more constraints because of course, constraining it more and forcing the latent space to have a certain topology or a certain shape or a certain geometry, this also decreases your reconstruction objective a little bit. But in general, we are, we are performing extremely favorably in particular when we look at for example, a density-based measure, these, these KL divergencies uh, are calculated for a, for a distance to a measure density estimator where we are essentially looking at how well a method is capable of preserving the density of the original space in the latent space on, on a batch level. And you can see that we're always among the top performers there. So with this, I'm coming to an end, there is a lot of open questions still remaining. Let me briefly give you, give you some along the way. 
So the first question that we have to ask ourselves, should we learn filtrations or use fixed ones? I have a recent paper out with colleagues from, uh, from Salzburg, from Austria, where we try to learn graph filtrations. And if you're interested in this, there's a, there, there will be a link on the website. It's also an ICML paper. And in this, we, we, we show that learning a filtration can be beneficial in, in some cases. But of course, there's also the question, is it better to use a fixed representation or fixed filtration that is maybe robust to certain aspects of your data set? But moreover, another challenging question that always comes up when we, when we do these sort of analyses is, can we map topological features back to features in the data? So can we say, oh, the cycle is created by the following elements or by the following, by the addition of the following elements? It turns out that this is not as simple as it might seem because we are looking at an algebraic formulation and it's possible that the algebra does something different than the geometry. But nonetheless, there, there is hope there that we, could, that we could make this a little bit more explainable or interpretable. The last question that I, that, I, that I have to say is still somewhat open is, how can we scale those algorithms to massive data sets? Because in the autoencoder, we were running exactly into the problem that I described early on. So the, the bigger the mini batch, the slower the algorithm, because we had to account for all these, all these different distances. At the, at the flip side though, we are only using distance matrices. So we're not restricted to any object representation. So if you have some objects for us and you can calculate distances between them, then we're good to go. Uh, but yeah, this, this is the price to pay maybe. And maybe, maybe there are smarter ways of doing this. Maybe we don't need all the features. Maybe we can do sparse filtrations, whatever. There's a lot of, of uh, research to be done, I think. So before I end, before I summarize this, I want to briefly give you a point at what is next. So this is a not too shameless advertisement. There is a workshop at NeurIPS 2020, which I'm co-organizing. And if you're interested in that, take a look at the website. It's called Topological Data Analysis and Beyond. You can submit your stuff there if you're interested in that. You can also just visit that for extremely great talks from a very diverse and, um, and interesting set of speakers. Uh, that cover many different domains. So we try to purposefully not only include the theoretical, um, the theoretical rock stars of the domain, but also the people who are in the trenches, who are doing the, who are using topology in interesting problems for biology, for example. And so this might be really interesting. We'll all be recorded. The lectures will be pre-recorded and you can take a look at them at your own leisure. Also, NeurIPS is $25 for students and I'm not being paid for this, but I wanted to point that out. I can also recommend this Giotto TDA library and it really might seem that way, but I'm also not being paid for them, but it's a neat way of integrating uh, TDA into your own projects because they follow this scikit-learn approach. So you have all these transformer classes with fit transform and whatnot. So it should be really, really neat and, and easy to do. And last but not least, I also want to urge you to join the TDA in ML Slack community. If you're interested in that, there's a lot of people now. We are, we are more than 250 people in there. Uh, people are creating all kinds of side channels, um, private channels for their projects. You can find um, anyone willing to answer your questions there if you're interested or giving giving a tutorial and um, we, we will also be using this to coordinate a lot of the things in the workshop and fielding questions to the speakers so give this a look if you're interested in that it would be would be happy to to have you there we're also is, looking for more. yeah pardon excuse me is the uh, link for the slack community active because i tried like uh two weeks ago and it wasn't that's a very good point. It should be it should be active, but Slack has a, has sometimes very weird ways of of deactivating those links. So I once created one that is that should have a, uh, an infinite uh, duration or validity, okay. but it's possible that it does not work anymore. So if it doesn't work and you want to join, just just tell me via email or via Twitter, and then I will create a a new link. Um, this definitely it's open for all. Um, we're happy to have you on board, regardless of whether you are. Uh, interested in that, whether you have already done some work with that, whether you want to learn it, whatever. So all, everyone's welcome. Uh, bring me your huddled masses to, 
to create TDA together. Uh, we're trying to make this into, into, into a neat community of, of like-minded people. And same goes for the workshops. So if you have anything that you want to share with the community or you want to learn something, please uh, come by, look at, the, look at the talks, give us some feedback. Um, if you feel familiar with TDA already, of course, feel free to join the program committee. We are looking for, uh, for reviewers. We are also taking recommendations for other people if you see that we missed someone on, on the list. So uh, I would be happy to, to, make this, to make this into a into very nice and inclusive event for the, for the NeurIPS community and for everyone else who is interested in machine learning. So do let me know if there's anything that you want to do in that vein, and I will be happy to support it. Like same goes also for, for emails, of course. If you have any questions there, just shoot me an email and we will try to make this happen. All right, so with this, I want to end this, uh, this lecture, this Tour de France in a sense. Uh, let me just tell you that I think that topological features are incredibly versatile. I hope that I could impress this, this fact on, on you a little bit. The integration into modern machine learning architectures is certainly an ongoing research topic. So there are, there are some successes already. There are some neat hybrid approaches that really, that really start to, to showcase the benefits here. I would say that right now, topological machine learning shines when working with structural information, such as the case of graphs, but there's also tons of other applications that are just waiting to be discovered. And I think the future, to be very optimistic, I would say that the future is probably, probably will probably belong to hybrid approaches that are capable of including more information than just the, these persistence diagrams that maybe you would need uh, information about the curvature of your, of your object. Maybe you would need to have other information about the manifolds. But I think that topological machining is one first step towards that. And it will be an incredibly versatile and rich field for the, for the years to come. And I hope that I could impart this a little bit on you and that you continue thinking about this, or maybe that you start to become a user or practitioner or a researcher in that area, that would make me very, very happy. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And now let's, let's start the last question round before, before, I have to, before I have to stop this. I think we're, we're more or less right on time. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thanks for watching. Okay, um, so I have a question, um, which is, I have looked into topology, but I'm talking about the math concept itself, uh, although I'm not, not a mathematician. And um, I would like to ask, why is it called topological data analysis? Because it doesn't seem, or it's not obvious to me that it starts with a topology as it is defined in abstract algebra. Uh, but I guess it has something to do with this. Ah, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. So it's, I think it's the difference between, um, between, algebra, between point set topology and algebraic topology. So algebraic uh, topology is defined on these I, sort of structural things. Yeah, sorry? I, what did you say is the difference between algebra, algebraic topology and? Point set topology. So okay. point, points where, where, you, where you really... Uh, we really try to describe open sets and closed sets and things like this. Okay. So, so there, there is kind of an overlap um, be, between, those, between those subjects, of course. But in general, I think it, I, I would say that it's called topological machine learning because it incorporates the, these ideas of structural information, of connectivity information. And in, a, in, in some sense, you find the same information in your in your point set topology approaches as well right when you define which set is open which set is closed things like this because those sets can be used to create a neighborhood and from this neighborhood information you can gain more information about the connectivity of your space and so on and so forth so i think that it's just it's just a, a let's say a higher level abstraction of looking at data because all of this 
TDA or topological data analysis in general has a very simplicial view on data sets. So it, it assumes that you have some way of creating a simplicial complex or a cubical complex from the data. And it, it tries to, it, it doesn't really describe functions on these data sets yet. It just describes simple connectivity invariants. So this is maybe, maybe, maybe this would be, maybe this would be a, a topic for the future. So how to actually also describe functions in that spaces and, and what can we learn from this and so on and so forth. So in, in your case, are you using algebraic topology, the term, or you are using point set? So in, for all of this, I would say it's algebraic, definitely. It's like, it's like you, you describe a simplicial complex, you describe simplicial chains and, and all these sort of things. And in the end, you do some algebraic calculations by reducing matrices and, and whatnot. And this yields a set of invariants that you can use to describe your space. So I would say that, that, that this is more like an, an, an algebra approach than a... So this is like a subset of point set topology and point set topology is more general topology. Well, I'm, I'm at the risk, of, at the risk of, of alienating the topologists that are watching this. I would say that it's the, the other way around. So I would say that point set topology is a little bit more fundamental and then you go a little bit higher in terms of the abstraction level and then you have algebraic topology and differential topology, which are both two ways of looking at, at manifolds or, or looking at, at complex spaces. Differential topology is more about describing, I would say functions on those on those spaces and algebraic topology is more about calculating invariant information of those spaces. But I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would want to be quoted like this. So <laughs> it's more like my way of structuring, structuring those two, those two fields. Okay. Oh, I'm seeing some more questions here so at the moment topological yeah. topological data analysis is uh, analysis of homology groups by these persistent diagrams or i would say mostly there's also other approaches but they boil down to to similar concepts so if you're familiar with this notation, there's also people who are doing something called mapper, the mapper algorithm, which uh, gives you a way to, to calculate nerves of your, of your data and visualize them. So this, this is also, this, this, this is also one, one aspect there, but I would say that the working horse, at least, I'm, I'm confident in saying this without, without making more enemies along the, along the road, the working horse of topological data analysis right now is definitely persistent homology, where you calculate those persistence diagrams and all those other descriptors. This is kind of the working horse. There's a lot of other approaches nowadays that take a look at, for example, uh, circular features in a data set, um, but the, wor the working horse is still this sort, of, this sort of machinery because it's also the one that is easiest to integrate, I would say, into a standard machine learning pipeline. So, so fundamental groups are too hard. <laughs> yeah, you're, uh, yeah no, well, people are, people are working on this, but you're absolutely right. I mean, this is coming. I mean, if I had to, if I had to do the same lecture again for, for a, for a topology based audience, so the, let's say the young topologist workshop or something, I would definitely say that fundamental Fundamental groups are coming. I mean, there is homotopy, computational homotopy theory, which goes in, in that direction. I just have to be very, very clear that I don't feel confident in saying how far ahead they are. So, so what you can actually do with this. I find them mathematically, I find them fascinating and intellectually very, very pleasing. I'm just not aware of any usage in machine learning currently. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have you considered also uh, other um, systems? Um, for example, I have two things in mind where I would like to ask whether these have been in consideration is 
your topological autoencoder sounds a little bit like a variational autoencoder in in that sense that um, you are putting some um, constraints in a way on the latent space in the middle of the autoencoder. So that's this aspect. You you put this topological constraint on there, and variational autoencoder put this yeah probability. Mm -hmm aspect on there is this uh, I don't know whether it makes sense to any in, in, in any way to combine these or to consider this I mm. uh, really I don't have any ideas myself but mm. it just rings the bell in a way you know what I mean yeah no I, I this is a, this is a very this is a very insightful comment uh, in fact I would say that we are yeah we, we are essentially doing that we're just looking at at topological variation in a sense right so we are um, there's this yeah. theoretical view and then there's this topological view and it would be interesting to see whether the two can be combined. I also have to say that I have not given any thought to this um, until until now, but definitely, definitely this is a good analogy for us. So we are, we are to, we are to regular autoencoders what a VAE is to a regular autoencoder. We are just the same thing in, in a topological sense. So you're also trying to regularize. A little bit. Also, have you considered um, con uh, combining this with uh, more like probabilistic approaches? I'm again the variational autoencoders sort of combining autoencoders with mm -hmm. probabilistic ideas, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, mm -hmm. there are also this morning I heard the lecture about probabilistic circuits, mm -hmm. which is sort of like a neural network in a way, but it has a probabilistic. Um, quality to it so that you can ask questions not just what is it a cat or a dog this picture but something like what is the probability of if this and this happens then that and that will happen so you can ask a lot more different things it's much more versatile than regular neural networks so uh, again no idea whether topology where this would come into the picture there but um, maybe there's some connection again um, <laughs> I think there, yeah. there certainly there certainly is. Uh, in fact, there there is a there is a whole subfield that looks at the topological features of random simplicial complexes or Gaussian random fields, for example. So you take a random process on on a structured domain and you take a look at what the distribution of of your topological features would look like. And so I think that this will also probably probably the future will also belong to those approaches that are capable of, of also assessing a, a probabilistic view on these features, because that's what you get essentially, right? If, you, if we pick multiple mini batches, then we get a distribution over, over topological features and capturing this and regularizing over this exactly. will, be, will be a good view. So you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, I'm looking very much forward to, to give you another plug. I'm looking forward to Peter Bubenik the inventor or creator or discoverer, whatever you want to call it, of the persistence landscapes, he will also be giving a talk at the NeurIPS workshop. And I think this will be a little bit about probabilistic modeling. And this, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this talk and to, to learning more about this myself. Uh, I think that this could be an interesting view. At the same time, I also want to stress that topology is much more fundamental and I don't mean this in a way to denigrate uh, probability theory, but I'd rather mean this in a way to, to like curb the enthusiasm for topology, even though my job is to raise enthusiasm. But the idea is that it captures a lot of fundamental properties of a space. But the question is whether those properties are actually really driving classification or are really driving the, the problems that you, are, that you are working on, right? So... It's, it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a different lens through which to view the world. Whereas probability theory has all kinds of neat applications already and a kind of neat intuition where you say, oh, we have this causality view and this, this, this modeling view and so on and so forth. And this, these sort of things are still missing in the, in the topology world. I think they will come given enough time, but the building these bridges between the, the pure mathematics and the, the machine learning world is not very easy. And current, currently, you in for your topological autoencoder, you're just inputting, you're just calculating the persistent diagram once, right? 
and then you just plug this as a feature into the autoencoder. Well, of course, with the loss, but... Um, but no, no, wait a second. I have, to, I have to stop you there. So we calculated okay. once on the input, on the input latent, uh, pardon me, on the mini batch input space. There we only calculated once because, of course, if we pick one mini batch, we cannot change its topology, right? This is the topology right. that we get. But we do allow the latent space persistence diagram to be okay. changed. Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, because I'm trying to make the connection that you said earlier with the, um, but now I'm getting this, what you mean, you have the mini batch and then with varying mini batches, you would kind of develop a, a probability based on that because all these, you can calculate how probable a feature is sort of your, it's sort of your, your persistent diagram is one random variable, one very complex but random variable in a way. And yes. then you calculate the, um, over this complex random variable, you calculate your probabilities, sort of, and then you have a probabilistic model in a way. And then that way you could combine all of that. Okay, got, yes. understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but but I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that have to be done. I mean, this uh, this autoencoder approach, we're really happy the way this turned out, but it's also pretty clear that we are that we are scratching the surface of something that is much more complicated. I mean, in mm -hmm. Even when you go towards saying what kind of what kind of information do you actually want to preserve, so regular having an additional layer of of regularization, for example, would be very very interesting. All right. Um, any any other questions? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, at first, thanks for the great talk. And if it's okay, I would ask one more thing. Yeah, yeah. At the beginning of the lecture, you said it's used on grass a lot, like the Betty numbers. Yeah. Uh, is there any consideration in looking at like neural networks in general to analyze them with Betty numbers? For instance, like if this, um, I don't know how it's called, persistency, if, this, if a, a, a hole somewhere in the neural network I don't know, vanishes, then maybe the network is starting to overfit Oh yeah. or something yeah. like it? Uh, yes, in fact, there is. Uh, this is, um, we have another paper on this very topic. It's called Neural Persistence. It's an ICLR paper from 2019. Uh, I didn't include it here in the slides because it would go a little bit beyond the the idea of classification. So I was mostly focusing on representation-based learning, but you're absolutely right. I think that topology can also be useful in describing what is going on with a, with a neural network. So when it, start, what it starts to learn and so on and so forth. And um, maybe, maybe, yeah, I, I, will put this, I will put this on the website um, afterwards, uh, but you can also find it on, I think, my Google Scholar profile where, where, we, where we were analyzing this. Right now, I have to say that the state of the art in this, uh, in this particular research strand is that we are limited to fully connected networks. So we try to extend this approach, we try to extend this view to convolutional networks, but it didn't work as easily as we would, ex uh, as we would expect it to work. And so right now we can only do this for fully connected networks, but we showed how to use this persistence value. So the essentially the topological complexity of the, of the network's weights, we were able to show how to use that as, a, as an early stopping criterion that does not require additional validation data. So this was, oh, yeah. was the first step in, in that direction. Uh, but I have to say that again, this is also, this is just scratching the surface. So I think that, that, this, is, that this is the right way to approach certain, certain analyses in the neural network world. By, by which I mean that you have to understand what the network is actually learning, what the, what the network is kind of seeing or, or what kind of structural information you, you can get out of it. Um, but again, this is, this is a very open topic for, for future research, I would say. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any, anything else? I, I am working on a clustering uh, method. I will have the talk tomorrow. It's called Gauss shift. 
mm -hmm. um, not for advertisement, but simply um, I'm currently looking into a combination of that with some other methods. And um, I don't know, you, you probably have heard of dbscan. Um, of course, yeah. And there are some, some other methods that are related to dbscan and they are, can be interpreted as topological data analytical methods with mm -hmm. like terminology like persistent homology and stuff mm -hmm. also coming up. Uh, actually without the persistent diagram. So it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the persistent diagram. And, um, and my method again is somewhat related to it. Um, I would be interested in, in, in talking about that, but maybe later um, in, oh, yeah, in case. Definitely. That's yeah. actually why I came to your course. Okay. Um, because I think this has nothing to do with the directly like the persistent diagram that you're doing, mm -hmm. but it's still somewhat strongly related to this. So I would be interested in, yeah. Definitely. Talk. I mean, should, should you we can need talk. email? Or yeah, you, can, you can check out my talk, then you get a sort of a quick uh, introduction on what I'm doing, mm -hmm. what I'm doing. <laughs> If, if you're interested, um, but or we can chat, yeah. No, I'm definitely. I'll definitely take take a look at it. I mean, this is uh, this is the cool thing about virtual conference, right? You can you can take a look at the things in your in your own time and see and pick and choose a little bit. So I'm really happy I, to to hear about these sort of things because that's also something that is not currently on our radar. So there's a lot of things that I didn't mention so far. For example, the idea of what to do for time series analysis or how it can actually help in in clustering or can it help in clustering? That's kind of the that's kind of the question, right? So uh, I'm re really yeah I'm really interested in this. Thanks thanks for dropping thanks for dropping this. How how to contact you or how to give you the talk? Uh, name uh, I think the the easiest thing is to um, so I'm I'm available on on Hoover or on um, or via the email that I posted here or via Twitter. Uh, so this these are all um, okay. This would all work. Okay, any, anything else? Uh, uh, hello, I'm uh, just curious, uh, was this, what it is a persistent diagram of a persistence diagram? Pardon me? Uh, uh, I mean, a persistent diagram is a 2D diagram, no? Uh, yes. So each yeah. point, you can think as a data point. If mm -hmm. you apply the persistent diagram of a persistent diagram, what? Would oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure what would happen if you do this iteratively. I think you would converge at some point to a to probably a a space that has only a single topological feature. I'm not, I'm, but I'm not sure about this. I mean, iterated persistence uh, would be would be an interesting interesting thing to try out. I mean, for sure. Oh no! Wait, you wouldn't actually, you wouldn't actually converge on, the number of features wouldn't actually decrease. But I'm I'm not sure if anyone ever ever considered this so far. But uh, would be an interesting, it would be an interesting direction. Okay, thank you. But uh, any intuition, because it's the how uh, transition connects each other, no? so how, how transition, let's say, cluster, or I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I would say that, uh, first of all, of course, the first step in this iteration is already, can already be from a very high dimensional space to a very, to a very low dimensional space. But then if you start reapplying this, you would never get rid of the, of the components, of the connected components, of the zero dimensional connected components. So in essence, you would always, I think, keep the cardinality of the persistence diagram, and you would merely change the, you would merely probably change the scales. Maybe, maybe the iterated persistence diagram would converge towards a diagram that has all the points on the diagonal. That I could sort of, sort of see or understand, because it means that with every, every it's kind of like, a, like an iterated compression. You would always lose more and more information, but I'm not so sure about that. Just a conjecture. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, another quick question. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, maybe you mentioned at the beginning, but uh, so the complexity of uh, building these uh, 
persistence, persistence diagram is a poly, so is a square exponential. So in the number of data points, it can actually go. So the, the formally the the worst case complexity is two to the power of n, where where n is right. the number of, of data points. But this is the actual. This is the really worst, worst, worst case that you can get. In general, the for low dimensions, you have efficient algorithms for n log n, and in general, it's observed that it has a sublinear or linear complexity in the number of simplices of your simplicial complex. So this is the this is the the answer that I that I would that I would give. Yeah, but the simplices uh, how it can be. Uh, the class or the number the the number so so it, it so it's so if you have so if you have a um, you can have a squared number of simplices uh, of course uh, starting from your starting from your data point so the simplicial complex defines the set defines the the complexity class of of the of the persistent homology calculator but, uh, but this is exponential no, in theory yes in theory yes yes but there's a there's a disconnect because you because many people don't actually calculate the whole Vietoris Rips complex, but they just stop at a certain dimension. And then of course you have fewer simplices than two to the power of n. But yes, in general, okay. you could say that this is this is the worst case complexity, yes. Thank you. Okay, any any other questions? Okay, I mean, in this case, thank you very much for attending and I look forward to, to hearing back from you. It would be interesting to get, get some additional feedback if you, if you like this or maybe even, maybe even see you in, in the TDA and ML channel. And if you have any further questions, feel free to contact me over any of those communication channels. And I wish you a very pleasant conference and very, uh, very good, research topics and very inspiring, inspiring talks. So bye-bye uh, and, and see you soon. <laughs>